everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for, for coming to listen uh, to the talk. Uh, extremely excited to talk more about uh, Visa's view on stablecoins and you know, what we're seeing. So I guess just as a starting point, for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Noah. I lead on-chain analytics at Visa. Uh, prior to this role, I was uh, at a company called Artifact. Uh, it's Nike's NFT subsidiary. Uh, and I recently graduated from Stanford. So I guess you know, at Visa, when we talk about stablecoins and uh, you know, what it takes to understand them, we think there's really three key imperatives. First, it's imperative to look at the on-chain data, uh, you know, see the macro trends, uh, and understand how stablecoins are being used and for which use cases. Second, we think it's important to, to actually go out and talk to users, uh, understand you know, what pain points are stablecoins solving, and you know, how are they being used across the world. And then lastly, uh, we think it's important to you know, learn from the first two uh, to you know, really launch great products. So throughout today's presentation, I'm going to kind of go through all three of these uh, and, and use it as a framework to, to share more about what Visa's doing and also what we're seeing in the space. And so obviously to start, we're going to talk about on-chain data. So uh, something that I continue to hear over and over and over again, it was even mentioned today, um, but there's a lot of data that's always going around saying how stablecoin volumes are approaching the likes of large payment networks like Visa. Uh, you know, Nick Carter had this, this uh, image that he put on Twitter last year, and it got a lot of notoriety and attention. And you know, the reality is, is that um, you know, there's a lot of noise in stablecoin volume. There's high-frequency trading. There's bots. There's internal smart contract transactions. You know, all these things are, are really important to, to blockchains and something that's unique about how stablecoins move. But ultimately, they don't necessarily uh, fully correlate with you know, payments networks. And so I guess this is kind of a litmus test. Uh, in 2021, there was a month uh, where USDC volume on Solana was greater than the United States GDP for the year by $10 trillion. And so you know, at Visa, when your primary audience is central bankers and regulators and other financial institutions, and you throw around numbers like that, they don't really take you very seriously. Um, and so as a result of this, uh, we decided that it was imperative for us to you know, create our own dashboard so that kind of showcases uh, how stablecoins are being used and, and really make it you know, free to use, easily digestible, and, and, and just something that, um, that these type of people will, will understand. And so as part of this dashboard, uh, we created this adjusted volume methodology alongside Allium Labs, Artemis Analytics, and, and Cast Island Ventures, and basically just to, to take away a lot of this noise. And so I think when you look at this chart, there's really two, two takeaways that I would take from this. You know, first, uh, when you look at like normal, just non-adjusted uh, stablecoin volume, you see that the, there's these huge peaks and troughs, which oftentimes correspond to the market dynamics. Um, but looking at this chart, when you, when you actually adjust for it, you can see that it's high and to the right. And then I think the second interesting takeaway from here is that over the last 12 months, there's been over $5 trillion in adjusted volume, which, again, is, is not Visa numbers, but it's, it's still very substantial. Um, and so I guess taking an even deeper look into, you know, what is this $5 trillion coming from, the number one category that we're seeing is that 38% of this uh, is actually deposits and withdrawals from centralized exchanges. And so I think this kind of segues into the second really key on-chain data trend that we're seeing. And it's that centralized exchanges, you know, a few years ago, I think if you were to say, like, what is the, the use case for them, people would say, oh, well, it's a place a venue to speculate Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and, and other cryptocurrencies. And what we're seeing now more, more than ever is that these centralized exchanges are actually becoming an FX venue for stablecoin and fiat. And so, for example, here, here's like a, a select regional exchange. We see that 40% of monthly volume is actually going between fiats and stablecoin. And so, you know, to take, you know, again, another deeper look at this, uh, this was another great chart Artemis provided us with. We can see that over the last year, uh, USDC payment volume from U.S. exchanges to Mexican exchanges has grown 30% month over month uh, and recently crossed 100 million in volume. And so, again, this is an example of how stablecoins are being used for remittances and B2B and payroll and, and a bunch of actual real payments use cases where you're simply just replacing a network like SWIFT with stablecoins in the middle, and these exchanges are serving as on and off ramps on both ends. And so this is something that we're seeing and we're really excited about. And then the, I guess the, the last piece of data or trend that's interesting um, is, you know, today over 70 million wallet addresses hold a stablecoin. And so, again, heard a lot of talk today about active addresses and, like, what does that mean and what's good and bad. But I think you can't deny that the, the trend line here and, and the general direction is, is still high and to the right, and, and that number is, is substantial. 
And I think another also follow-up question may be, well, are these people who had a stable coin a couple years ago and forgot about it in some wallet and now they can't access it? Um, but if you, you, know, you look at the, the chart of new addresses that are sending a stable coin each month, you can see that that also has a similar trend line. And in September, 12 million, over 12 million addresses sent a stable coin that never sent a stable coin before. So these are, these are some of the, those are some of the trends that we're seeing from the on-chain data perspective. Um, I think the second area that, again, we've been really focused on is how can we make an effort to go and talk to users and, and better understand how they're using stable coins. And so really excited that you know, over the summer we commissioned this report with Nick Carter and the Castle Island Ventures team and, and Brevin Howard to go out and actually survey 2,500 crypto users among five emerging markets to better understand how they're using stable coins. And so I guess, first of all, like, I highly recommend reading this if you haven't already, and this, uh, you know, this is just a glimpse into it. But you know, the major takeaway we had from the survey was that stable coins are, are definitely being used for, for use cases beyond just crypto. And so, like, for example, 72% of respondents say they're going to increase stablecoin usage in the future. 69% of them have at one point converted between local currency and a stablecoin. Uh, 39% are, are using stablecoins to earn a yield, which, you know, in some cases with the yield-bearing stablecoins are, are, are sort of democratizing access to new financial products. And then also 32% of respondents have sent money international, internationally before using stablecoins. Um, so again, all of these things are, are just signs that show that in these emerging markets where they do have you know, real problems either with their current banking coverage or, or making payments, stablecoins are actually a, you know, solving problems for them. And then I guess even you know, looking at this even more so on a you know, country by country basis, we see that you know, in India, 44% of the respondents are using stablecoins to obtain better currency rates. 64% of the Nigerian respondents are um, you know, saving money in dollars using stablecoins, uh, where it's a place where it's really hard to access dollars. Uh, in Brazil, 31% are, are converting local currency into stablecoins. Uh, Turkey, 55% to earn a yield, and then lastly, 54% of the people in Indonesia uh, sending money internationally via stablecoin. So again, this is a, a very high level overview, highly recommend reading it, but this is just another, I guess, uh, point of proof that shows that it's not even just the data. If you go and talk to these people, you'll hear it's solving real problems for them. And so then the last thing, and, and you know, we'll quickly cover over this, um, but we really believe that stablecoins are, are you know, critical to, to launching great products within Visa. And so today I'm gonna kind of briefly cover three of the products that, that we've done within Visa. I think if you look at these, you know, before even going into detail, the high level, uh, I guess, takeaway is all three of these products are, are, are us at Visa utilizing stable coins to bridge between traditional financial institutions and, and blockchains. And that's a role that we feel like we, um, we, we can play. And so starting with issuance, um, today we work with over 55 wallet partners to, to help them issue a Visa credential on top of a wallet. So for example, uh, Lemon is a, a partner, a wallet partner that we work with in Argentina. Um, many people in Argentina are struggling with currency devaluation. Uh, they often prefer to get payroll in, in USDC or USDT versus, um, you know, versus their local currency. Um, and so they may use a partner like Lemon. You know, today, if, if they have a, a, a stablecoin balance in one of these wallets, in order for them to go and spend it, they have to go and you know, con you know, convert out of it and then withdraw it and then like, figure out how much they need. Uh, by linking a card with it, it's a very seamless and simple process and it makes it a lot easier for them to, to use stablecoins more in their life. And I, I made sure to include the, the Steakhouse Gnosis Pay dashboard because we think it's pretty cool within Visa that there's a, there's a Dune dashboard that relates to uh, issuance programs. So uh, that's also pretty exciting. Um, and then the second product that I kind of want to quickly highlight is Stablecoin Settlement. Again, like at Visa, our, one of the core things we do is we connect issuing and acquiring banks together. Uh, and oftentimes when this is cross-border, they, they can't settle in, in local currencies. And so issuing banks need to actually uh, you know, send money via SWIFT. And this could take multiple days. And we actually have issuers today that are, you know, may have like delay fees or, or, or timing issues because of that. And so their ability to settle with us in USDC solves a lot of pain points for them. And then similarly, we also enable uh, acquires to get paid in USDC as well, um, as that enables some of their crypto merchants who have a treasury based in stablecoins to actually accept it. And so this is something that we're in pilot today. We're, we're rapidly expanding it um, to you know, more locations, more blockchains, more stablecoins, but so far we've, we've solved a lot of problems uh, with that. And then I guess the last products, just to kind of touch on, we recently announced 
uh, VTAP, Visa Tokenized Asset Platform. So we're actually helping banks go out and issue their own stable coins. Um, we, we announced this with BBVA, their big Spanish bank that uh, is gonna be issuing a, a Euro-backed stable coin alongside Visa. Um, but again, we, we plan to expand that to, to many, more, uh, many more banks. Um, and then I guess just to kind of close out this presentation, um, it was important for me to do this um, as, a, as kind of a leaving message. So in 22, I was actually a, an intern at Visa um, and I was lucky enough to have an amazing manager who um, you know, really pushed me to learn blockchain analytics, learn Dune. I didn't know anything about blockchain data. I didn't know anything about SQL. I didn't, you know, didn't know what I was gonna be doing that summer, to be honest with you. And he said, you know, there's this really cool thing called Dune and you, know, you should go and try and learn it. And you know, after some pushback, um, I ultimately spent the entire summer dedicating myself to it. Um, made amazing friends throughout the Dune community and ultimately I, I did this final intern project where I basically showed what the big NFT brands were doing in terms of revenue, um, was you know, able to publish it on social media and then uh, to my surprise it went kind of viral uh, and it led to me getting my job at Nike and then ultimately the job at Visa and so I guess if there's anyone out here today who's listening who's either you know, of the camp of A, they uh, you know, they're creating dashboards or they're creating cool stuff, but they're worried that maybe somebody doesn't, you know, care or won't pay attention, or maybe you guys want to start and you want to try it, but you're worried that there's a big technical gap. You know, my hope is that this story and the fact that I can, you know, be up here today talking to you guys on behalf of Visa uh, is motivation that you guys should take that leap for yourself. So anyway, thank you guys so much for, for coming and, and really appreciate the support. So yeah, so can uh, open it up to Q&A, a few questions. Something there. Technical. Yelling works. Oh, stablecoin is actually being adopted on Tron. We don't know if it's true, if it's not. Did you guys look at this data, and what's the view? Yeah, for sure. So I think, you know, again, like I said before, highly recommend reading the report. I'm pretty sure we did ask a question about Tron. I know we definitely asked a question about USDT. It's very clear that USDT has a, has a lot of adoption, especially in these emerging markets, and it seems like it's, you know, primarily a result of it was kind of, you know, one of the first, and people were, were using it early on, and I think, you know, I was thinking about this myself, like, there's probably a lot better financial products that exist that I don't use today, and it's because the switching costs are so high, and so I think that's a key, a key reason why. Um, but again, I don't remember if we specifically asked about Tron, but there's definitely a lot of, a lot of uses here, especially amongst emerging markets. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on stablecoin fragmentation and especially the um, example you gave at the end where you're working with BBVA to issue a BBVA euro-backed stablecoin. How do you see the future of you know, many different banks all issuing their own euro and then the fragmentation that this might create? Do you have any kind of thought and, and solution for that? For sure, yeah. So I think still TBD is to what the, the future uh, kind of holds there. I think Currently, our perspective is there's going to be several stable coins, there's going to be several blockchains, and it's important for payment companies who want to integrate stable coins to be stable coin and blockchain agnostic. So today with digital currency settlement, you know, we're working with Ethereum, Solana, and USDC. Our plan is to expand that out and, and support as many stable coins and as many blockchains as possible, because ultimately that seems to be the direction we're going. And then similarly with VTAP, like we see you know, banks also playing a, an important role, and, and we want to effectively you know, serve as a bridge to, to help bringing them all together. So, so yeah, definitely think that there's gonna be uh, a lot of players there and it's up, for, uh, you know, up to us to ultimately figure out how to make them all interoperate. Someone here? Um, hello, uh, thank you for your work. Um, okay. I use uh, Gnosis Pay on a daily basis. Um, that's uh, one of your products, I think. Uh, do you, are you planning to make other cards like this? And uh, what's your experience with uh, self-custodial uh, products? Yeah, for sure. So are, is your question specifically asking about self-custodial programs? And Yeah, for sure. So 
So we're seeing a ton of really exciting developments on the self-custodial side. You know, a couple of the partners we work with today, like Rain and Reap, are actually creating smart contract technology to, to enable you to have a self-custodial you know, uh, wallet and then link a card to it. And so I think that's one of the biggest trends, I'd say, of the year in terms of crypto card issuance. Um, so it's definitely something we're very supportive of and we think is going to become increasingly important. And at Visa, you know, our whole thing is how can we, how can we help support them? Um, but, but as I mentioned, there's a lot of great technology companies that are out there that are building really cool products to, to help with that. So definitely think that's going to be a long-term trend in our, our industry. Hello, hi. Um, so going back on stablecoin fragmentations, so now we have a lot of different chains, a lot of different stablecoins, and we, we even have deployments of community-owned stablecoins and also unofficial USDC, unofficial USDT. So I'm just curious, like, how do you guys think about this? Do you guys also consider that as part of the ag aggregated volume, or do you guys will only look on certain chains with certain liquidities? Yeah, so I think, like, specifically looking at our dashboard, you'll see we've, you know, exclusively focused on the, the fiat-backed stablecoins, um, and then we've looked at mostly the ones that are obviously top in supply, and, you know, but that list is growing, and, and again, like I said before, I think we see all of these as, as competitive players, and I think as you add more stable coins, there's gonna be more adoption, but then there's also gonna be more work to be done to, to link them together. So um, again, there's a, it feels like every day a new stable coin gets announced, whether it's a Revolut, and then there's, you know, last week there's this new consortium uh, with Paxos, so there's a lot of exciting stuff with, with new players coming into the stable coin space. Again, I think it's, it's gonna be critical for us to figure out ways to, to link them all together, but they're definitely all legit, and they're definitely something that we're, we're paying attention to. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So uh, one more round of applause for Noah. That was great. <laughs>